praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, content director for the Fatima Center. I'd like to provide you with a brief introduction to our 2020 calendar. This resource is part of our continuing effort to bring Our Lady of Fatima's message to a wider audience. With artistic beauty, the calendar highlights 12 apparitions of Our Lady that span 2,000 years of church history. But more importantly, it shows how they all fit together harmoniously in God's divine plan, a plan in which Our Lady holds a singular and unique role, and how her intercession has reached a kind of crescendo or summit at Fatima. The following video is a talk which I gave this past October in Rome, when I briefly explained these apparitions, some key Fatima events, and their importance for our time. Now, while Our Lady has appeared well over a dozen times, we could only select 12 apparitions, one for every month. And we made the effort to pick an apparition which historically occurred in that given month. Now, there's only one exception, but it's because, as far as I know, we don't know the exact date of that apparition. Now, you can request this beautiful calendar by contacting the Fatima Center or going to the calendar page at our website. You can also listen to an audio-only version of this talk at our podcast online. Its advantage is that I was able to edit it and put in a little bit more information. Please do share this with your family and your friends, the calendar, and the accompanying talk. As you can tell, winter is fast approaching, and that means Christmas time as well. These calendars do make excellent gifts, and they help spread Our Lady's message. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'd like to thank you all for making it here to our Fatima Conference in Rome. And what we'd like to do in this particular talk is place the message of Our Lady of Fatima in its historical context. What I have found over talking to a lot of people is that very often they know some basic things about Fatima. For example, they know Our Lady appeared, they usually know it's Portugal, three shepherd children, and they know she talked about prayer, the rosary, and penance. But oftentimes beyond that, that's all their knowledge really is about. And we at Fatima Center want to try to make sure that the full message of Our Lady is coming across. So we're going to split this talk into two parts. Uh, in the first part, what we're going to do is really place this message in its historical context across 2,000 years of Christian history because I think that's the real first step in understanding the message of Our Lady. Sometimes it's a little confusing, I think, for especially non-Catholics, but I even find it among Catholics where they have this strange idea that uh, like Our Lady of Fatima is not the same as Our Lady of Lourdes or Our Lady of Guadalupe, or they only want to have devotion to Blessed Mother under one particular title. I mean, in the Litany of Loretta, we have 49 titles that are just there. Uh, so. We want to show that continuity in her message, especially so that we see how Fatima is part of the message Our Lady's always been bringing us, and more importantly, it's part of the message that her son, Jesus Christ, has always been bringing to us. So that's the first half, and we'll go through that really quickly. We're just going to hit some highlights. And then in the second half, we'll zero in a little bit more specifically on the message of Fatima and some of the details that are important and that people don't often know. So we'll begin. Obviously, when you're talking about Mary, it's good to go back to the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appeared to her 
and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. We could say all our Marian devotion goes back to the very fact and all her prerogatives and all her privileges back to the very fact that she is the mother of God. So everything flows from that. And this is the moment when she says yes to God's holy will, giving us an example that we should always follow. In fact, when you look at Our Lady's messages, sort of an echo that runs through all of them are her words. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done to me according to thy word. Those are words we should make our own. And if we want to be devoted to Our Lady, we say that often. Okay? And this is going to be basically an undercurrent in the entire message of Our Lady for 2,000 years. So important to start there. Next, I think, very important step. Oftentimes, Catholics don't know about this one either. And that's that in the year 40 AD, October 12th, in Saragossa, Spain, St. James. This is St. James the Greater, the Apostle, the brother of St. John. And our Lord always takes Peter, James, and John. So James went off to Spain, and he is preaching to the pagans in that area and was having a very difficult time with conversions. And he's on the bank of the Ebro River, and on a column, Our Lady appears to him. So Our Lady had not yet even been assumed into heaven. She's still living over in the Holy Land, in that area, and she appears to him. It's a good message with a number of things, just to highlight that she says, God wishes to be glorified and magnified where the treasures of his right hand shall be opened for all the faithful through my intercession, if they ask for them in faith and sincere piety. For me, that's sort of like the highlight of that message. And one of the things I think this is so important is it shows, contrary to what many people say, certainly Protestants, but even times Catholics who have been imbued with uh, the new ideas and the new theology and all the new things running around these days, is that Marian devotion is, quote unquote, just a devotion. And by that, they're trying to say, uh, you can leave it off if you don't want to do it. Well, that's completely false. If you are going to be a Christian, a disciple of Christ, Marian devotion is essential. It's not an option. We must have Marian devotion. And I like this apparition so much because it shows how Marian devotion, and in fact Marian apparitions, are apostolic in origin. We all know how important it is to have apostolicity, our sacred tradition, our sacred scriptures, really even the magisterium, they all go back to apostolicity. And we see here that Marian devotions also go back to that. Not to mention that when she's going to be assumed into heaven at her dormition, all the apostles gather around her. And I mean, there's a tremendous apostolic uh, devotion to Our Lady there seen. But we're blitzing through, so we can't do every Marian apparition, and we can't do every Marian devotion, just very quickly. We're going to jump now all the way to the year 1214 when St. Dominic is fighting the Albigensian heresies. And as many of you know, she appears to him when he's doing much penance, asking how can I conquer these heretics and bring them back to the faith, save souls and bring them back to the Holy Church. And Our Lady appears to him and tells him, gives him the rosary and says, preach my Psalter. You will obtain an abundant harvest. In this kind of warfare, spiritual warfare, the rosary is always the battering ram, and the soul that recommends itself to me by the recitation of the rosary shall not perish. And uh, Sister Lucia later on told us in a very famous interview, we'll reference it in a minute here later on, but it was in 1957, she said, now in this time, meaning our time, the rosary has more power than it's ever had before, that God's given it that, and that there is no difficulty whether it be familial, personal, social, on the level of nations, international, no problem so large that the rosary cannot overcome. It's one of the very important reasons why you have to carry that spiritual battle, that spiritual weapon, sword, into battle with us. And shortly thereafter, still in the same century, 1251, Our Lady appears to St. Simon Stock in Aylesford, England. And she gives him the brown scapular, which is like our spiritual shield. So we always want to be wearing that shield because it's Our Lady's pledge of salvation to us. Okay, she promises that if we are faithful to the wearing of the scapular and fulfill what's supposed to go with it, for example, praying the rosary is usually uh, daily, is usually what a priest will uh, ask you when he invests you with the scapular because it's no longer the divine office, uh, sorry, the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and uh, living chastely according to your state in life. Okay, so those are important things when you wear your scapular. You're committing to that as well. But if you commit to that and fulfill that, Our Lady promises, whosoever dies wearing the scapular 
shall not suffer eternal fire, where it devoutly and perseveringly, so that's what I was just emphasizing, to be clothed in it means you are continually thinking of me. And then our Blessed Mother says, and I in turn am always thinking of you and helping you secure eternal life. So we want to make sure we have our rosary, our sword, and our scapular, our shield. And both of those two, I mention them here because they will play a central role in the message of Fatima. Again, showing the consistency in Our Lady's message across the many centuries. Another great apparition, Our Lady of Guadalupe, excuse me, Our Lady of Guadalupe appears to St. Juan Diego. This was in Mexico City on Tepeyac Hill, December 12, 1531. You're probably familiar with this apparition, but one of the things to really note is how this is right in the middle of the great Protestant Revolution. And so scholars estimate that about five million Christians in Europe were leaving the Holy Catholic Church, outside of which there's no salvation. And so what does Our Lady do, the great evangelizer who takes the gospel to all lands? She comes to the Americas, and the missionaries up to that point, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, they hadn't had much success. Many of the indigenous people were still clinging to their own heritage, their own pagan rituals. They didn't want to adopt the Catholic faith. They didn't understand it. They uh, were not about to bring in pagan rites into the Catholic Church. Fortunately, Our Lady just comes and speaks to them and shows herself as the mother of God and is their mother and she converts probably close to 10 million people. We have records from the Franciscans where just all day long they stood, had a bunch of baptismal fonts, lined them up, and the Indians just streamed forward. It's like they would pass in front of the image of Our Lady, the miraculous image on the Dilma, and they could read in their own language the message of the gospel, and they were just lining up to be baptized. And they were just baptizing thousands and thousands each day. They weren't even having to preach because Our Lady had done it all. And she has very tender words at that apparition uh, where she says, Am I not here, I who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Let nothing else worry you or disturb you. I mean, these are words she continues to bring us. This is why our Blessed Mother is appearing, because she wants to bring us this great message of maternal solicitude highlighted very nicely at Guadalupe. And then things took a really bad turn in history. It really starts with this age of enlightenment, so-called. I call it the darkening. Uh, it's the, also known as the age of reason, but I say it's the age of the loss of the use of proper reason. After the Protestant revolt, uh, man began to think he could figure out everything on his own, and he exalted reason and began to think faith was just, you know, a child's issue. And before you know it, those ideas gather steam in the 17th century. And then in the 18th century, 1789 specifically, the French Revolution breaks out. Uh, Freemasons were certainly behind it, engineering it, organizing it, trying to dethrone the secular powers, the political power of the kings, and also trying to dethrone the church and the pope. So their cry of the Freemasons was, destroy, altar, and throne. And there was a successful revolution in France where the church and the king were toppled. The king's got his head cut off. And so at this point in time, we can really see that the devil, the dragon, is intensifying his attack. Our lady responds by intensifying her aid. Right there in the heart of the French Revolution, its capital, Paris, she appears in 1830 to a young sister, St. Catherine Labouré, and she gives her the miraculous medal. I would say this is what ushers in the more modern age of Mary, which we're in now, but it, it's still got a ways to go. We have not gotten to the crescendo. I think Fatima is going to take us to the crescendo, but this is really sort of a starting point where Marian apparitions are going to increase in frequency, uh, where Marian devotion is going to be growing. And on that miraculous medal, if you're familiar with it, what's on the back? On the back, sort of almost intertwined, is the sacred heart of our Lord, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Okay, that's important because the Sacred Heart devotion had already been revealed to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque back in 1689, and that at that time, our Lord had wanted France to be consecrated to the Sacred Heart, which the kings never did. 
And then the Immaculate Heart is obviously going to play a very central role in Fatima. Our Lady has many graces to give us in this vision, and yet Catherine Labore notices that some of the rings which emit light are darkened. They're not emitting light. And she asks Our Lady, why? Why isn't grace coming from those rings? And Our Lady says, it's because people are not asking for them. They're graces I have and I want to give, but they're not asking. This really echoes to me what at Fatima she also says that so many souls go to hell because there's no one to pray for them. And that really reminds us how much we have to pray and beg Our Lady for those graces. 1846 then, only about 15 years later, she appears again in France, seat of the French Revolution, this time up in the mountains in the southern part of the country at La Salette to two children, Melanie and Maximian. And this is a heartbreaking apparition because Our Lady was, was weeping, always crying. Uh, she talked about how people were violating, especially the first, second, and third commandments that violate the, the greatest offenses against God, profaning his name, profan profaning his day, not keeping them holy. She talked about how she was getting so tired holding back the vengeful wrath of her son that it was going to fall down on the earth. She says, if my people don't submit, I'm going to be forced to let go of the hand of my son. The society of men is on the eve of the most terrible scourges. We're living in those scourges that were predicted. Even the good, the righteous, will suffer greatly. And then one of the most ominous things she says, which we're seeing, if not happening, certainly developing, it's, it's coming about. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. So all of these are prophecies. See, Our Lady is getting us ready. She knows what's going to happen. She's preparing us for it. She predicts that the revolutions will spread across the world, which they do. They spread across Europe. And this part's not known, and this part is not um, official. It's not in the documentation. Uh, but what I have read, I think very clearly, you've got to go back and read Pius IX bull when he declares the Immaculate Conception, okay, 1854. It seems rather clear to me that, if you don't know, when Pius IX was first elected, Pope in the 1830s, uh, maybe the 40s, doing this by memory, but uh, a lot of people thought he was going to be a liberal president. He was accepting some of the liberal reforms that were coming in Italy. And then there's the Great Revolution in Italy, 1846, 1848. A number of Pius' close advisors are assassinated just in the streets of Rome. I mean, here in this city, they're assassinated. And Pius IX fears for his life, and so he has to disguise himself like a normal priest and flees Rome at night. Uh, eventually, the revolution quelled. Various countries like France sent some armies, and Pius IX is able to come back to Rome. But I think that's when he really realized these liberal forces that were unleashed by the French Revolution, how terrible they were. And there's a dramatic shift in his papacy. So that today, most people know Pius IX as a very conservative pope. Uh, you know, he issued the Syllabus of Errors. Uh, he, does, he convenes the First Vatican Council, declares papal infallibility, does a lot to conserve the truth conserve tradition and you know, strengthen the faith. But I think another key point in his turnaround is not just him fleeing Rome and seeing what's going on, but he gets to talk to Maximin. Maximin, the boy La Salette, was given a secret he could reveal to no one but the Pope. And he speaks to Pius IX and he tells him what that secret was. Well, if you read Pius IX's letter carefully with this bull on the Immaculate Conception, at the end, he basically is saying, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically says, I, as Pope, we, using the royal we, we have done what you asked, Our Lady. Now please bestow graces on us. We expect, you know, the graces that you promised to come. And so you sort of have to wonder, well, what, what's he talking about? What is it that Our Lady asks that he has fulfilled? Well, the de Declaration of the Immaculate Conception. When did she ask that? Probably through Maximin at La Salette. So it's very possible that Our Lady of Lourdes and La Salette are intimately connected by the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. She comes at La Salette, she says, we got huge problems, you need to declare the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Turn away from all these liberal forces where you're leaning. The Pope obeys, obeys rather quickly. There's not that much time between 46 and 54. And then Our Lady responds with this amazing grace in Lourdes. In, 19, in, 19, in 1858, she appears at Lourdes, where she says, I am the Immaculate Conception, confirming the dogma of Pius IX and working countless miracles. 
To this day, no site in the world has more church-approved, bona fide, scientifically recorded miracles than Lourdes. Okay, so this shows that when Our Lady asks and we obey, well, she fulfills her promises and bestows many, many graces, many miracles. But Lourdes also has another tone. She says to Bernadette, I do not promise to make you happy in this world, but in the other. It's important to remember that. That's always Our Lady's promise, okay? Not in this world, but in the next. And she repeats, penance, penance, penance. Now, three times, that's important. She's calling the world to penance. Pray for sinners. And she also wanted the processions and the chapel built there. Many people know about that. But I emphasize that, penance, 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 because we're going to hear that again at Fatima. 1879, she appears in Ireland, where the Irish Catholics are still fighting for the faith, fighting the Protestantization of the English. If you know your Irish history, uh, things were rough at that time, uh, with the Irish trying to gain their independence, trying to hold on to their Catholic faith. This apparition is very interesting, though, because there were no words, always silent. And there's a vision of the Mass. So St. Joseph and St. John appear at Our Lady's side. And there's an altar, and on the altar, the Lamb, obviously, evoking the Mass. And complete silence. Now, again, I would venture an interpretation of this. Not that this is the only interpretation. With God's great miracles, there's always a lot of different levels that he's working on. But I clearly think one of them is to highlight the Mass, the silence. Look at it two ways. One is the silence of the Mass, which is a clear reference to the Latin Mass. But the silence also showing that that Mass would indeed be silenced in the future, would sort of be sent to the catacombs. It will be difficult to find this Mass. So that's at Our Lady of Knock. And then... Well, this one we have to go back in time, but not quite. Because while she appeared in 1610 in Ecuador, Quito, to Mother Mariana, she prophesied that all these prophecies would go unknown and hidden by most of the world until the 20th century, when men would need to hear it again. And so many of her prophecies that she gave in the 1600s are fulfilled 200 years later, and a lot of them are being fulfilled now, and some still need to be fulfilled from Our Lady of Buen Suceso. But she describes, you, you've got to get the book, you've got to read it, I can't do it justice, don't have the time, but do that, do some homework. Go back and look it up, there's books, it's on the internet, Our Lady of Good Success, or Buen Suceso, and you read what she's saying, it's like, it's like she's reading one of our newspapers of our time and telling us all the things exactly that are happening. Uh, the growth in immodesty, how there's a lack of faith and a loss of faith, how uh, Freemasonic elements have infiltrated the entire church, how the sacraments are no longer being treated, how marriage is under a complete disgrace, how there's no modesty found among women and purity in children has been destroyed. On and on go the lists. She even talks about how the clergy, those who speak, should speak and tell the truth, fall silent. So that's an important one, and I think it really connects to Fatima because what she's saying there is probably much of what she said again to Sister Lucia, but she knew Sister Lucia would be silenced, also echoing knock, and therefore the message would not be able to get out in that manner. So what does she do? Well, I mean, she's up in heaven with God. Time doesn't control her. So she can actually go back into the 1600s, give a message that's going to stay hidden during the time of Fatima, and after Fatima will resurface, and we can discover it so as to take great comfort knowing that Our Lady has been protecting us ever since then and giving us the plan for salvation that she's bringing to us. So Our Lady of Buen Suceso is certainly an important element here. Then we get to Our Lady of Fatima, Talk more about this in a minute, so I'm simply going to skip over Our Lady of Fatima right now. We'll mention the miracle of the sun, greatest public miracle not recorded in sacred scripture, which should be a great inducement to all of us to believe. And then, very important, again, a lot of people who know about Fatima don't necessarily know about Tui, but Tui is sort of like the ending to Fatima, and, and you really don't know Fatima if you don't know Tui. So Tui is when, uh, we call it Tui after the city in Spain, Sister Lucia was there, and Our Lady appeared to her then. She also received a great theophany, so a revelation of God, of the Blessed Trinity, 
we have a little bit of what she saw. You see that in the picture. She saw our Lord on the cross. She saw a chalice and host. So it was above the altar, completely evoking the mass. Uh, the Blessed Trinity was there. But she said she received certain mystical things that, one, she was not permitted to disclose, and two, human language could not describe. But it's at that moment that God asked for Russia to be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So June 13th, 1929. Uh, there's definitely something going on with that 13th day of the month when it comes to the Fatima apparitions. As you know, when she appears in 1917, it starts May 13th, and then it's the 13th of every month until October, with the exception of August, because that's when the little children were kidnapped. Uh, so the 13th is an important day there for Fatima. Okay, so this is placing it in context, and hopefully you can see how with the rise of evil and the devil sort of upgrading, up, uh, upping, intensifying his battle, so too Our Lady is coming and intensifying the graces that she is giving us. Second half, just to give you some important details about Fatima. 1914, World War I breaks out. At that time, it was called the Great War. People didn't know there was going to be a World War II. And people say that Pius X, St. Pius X, one of the greatest popes we've had probably in the last four or 500 years, died of a broken heart because he tried so hard to stop World War I. And so a little after it starts, he dies. Benedict XV is an elected pope. And he tries everything he can to stop the war, to bring people to peace. But year after year goes on, and all of our youth, of Europe's youth, is being thrown into the trenches. We've read about how horrible World War I was, just a slaughterhouse with the machine guns and the poison gas. And Benedict gets to a point where he sort of throws up his hands and says, there's nothing I can do. May 5th, 1917. He actually writes a letter, publicizes it, but it's a letter to Our Lady. And he basically says, Blessed Mother, help us. We need your help. And then he adds to the litany of Loreto, Regina Pacis, ora pro nobis. So that last line we always pray in the litany, Queen of Peace, pray for us, is added here by Benedict XV to try to do something about World War I. I hope you caught the date, May 5th, 1917. Eight days later, an octave has tremendous liturgical significance. Eight days later, May 13th, Our Lady is answering the Pope, and she's coming to Fatima, and she's bringing the solution that we need, bringing peace to the world, because that's ultimately what she offers. Okay, so there's a real powerful connection there. Part of her message at Fatima, she promised the children World War I will end. So she promises the end of that war also, but then remember, she's going to say, but if people don't shape up, if they don't do penance, stop offending God, do the prayer, do what they're supposed to do. A worse war will come. We didn't get things fixed. The worst, war, the worst war came. And a worse war is possibly looming before us still. Another important date is 1925, December 10th. That's when Sister Lucia was at Ponte Vedra, a different convent. And that's when our Lord appeared to her. And Our Lady appeared and showed her immaculate heart and the thorns in her immaculate heart. And Our Lady asks for the first five Saturdays devotion. So we should all be committed to that first Saturday devotion. Uh, that's what it was asked for, and it's definitely part of the Fatima message. I'm firmly convinced that we're not going to get the graces to outpour that Our Lady has promised at Fatima until more Catholics, more priests, more parishes, more bishops in their diocese are basically rallying the faithful, and we're all saying, we've got to do the first five Saturday. I mean, first Saturday is not a holy day of obligation, but I, I, in, in my home, we consider it a quasi-holy day of obligation. You know, I mean, uh, we can't bind anyone under the pain of mortal sin. You know, the bishops can or the pope can bind us. But as a father in my house, I can certainly bind my children in obedience that we're doing first Saturday. And, and it's, it's got to be really important because this is part of the message of Our Lady of Fatima. Then we had Tui. Now, during the 20s, notice what's happening also in the world. Right after Our Lady appears and gives us the miracle of the sun, October 13th, so in the Bolshevik, the Russian Revolution breaks out. See, before that, no one even knew that communism was coming and coming to the biggest country on the earth and was going to take it over. And throughout the 1920s, you have atrocity after atrocity taking place in Spain. I'm sorry, in Russia. And then in the 30s, communism begins to be exported throughout Europe, and it will reach Spain and all kinds of other places in the world. But by 1929, there was enough knowledge. Pius XI already knew enough about what's going on in Russia 
under the communists, under Stalin, the murder of millions of people and millions of Catholics and destructions of churches, they knew how evil Russia was. So in 1929, when she asks for that consecration, it should have made sense to people, but they didn't heed. However, on May 13th, 1931, the Portuguese bishops did consecrate their country to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And there was a great Catholic renaissance in Portugal. And Portugal was spared the ravages of World War II. People oftentimes don't know this. Uh, there was actually a Freemasonic, very liberal government in power in Portugal. Uh, they got ousted out of office, and Catholics came in and really brought the faith back much stronger into Portugal after this consecration. So Our Lady is fulfilling her promises and bringing graces even when just some of these smaller things are done, not the whole big thing she asks for. And then October 13th, 1931, again, significant dates, just six months later is when the Spanish Revolution broke out in Spain. And that devastated, if you haven't read about the martyrs in that Spanish Revolution and how bloodthirsty it was and how much they attacked and hated, hated Christ and the church, uh, it, it really is, Blood Drenched Altars is a great book to read, uh, but it's pretty horrific too because it gets a little graphic in how terribly they were killing uh, the Catholics, especially the bishops there and the priests in Spain. In the end, uh, communism didn't take over Spain. Spain got consecrated by the Spanish bishops to the Immaculate Heart of Mary also, uh, and then was preserved the ravages of World War II. But on 1938, January 25th, January 25th in the liturgical calendar is the conversion of St. Paul, so it's also an important date. But in 1938, that's when there was that vision, uh, that light in the sky that Our Lady had predicted. She said, if I'm not obeyed, then a worse war is coming once there's this light in the sky. Sister Lucia saw that light in the sky, and she confirmed with a spiritual director and a bishop that this was a sign God was giving the world that a worse war was coming. And sure enough, World War II was already sort of bubbling, and it was about to get intensified. Uh, we know what happened with World War II. And then an important date that people also don't know about. It reminds me so much of what we just talked about Benedict XV doing in World War I. Pius XII is at his wit's ends, doesn't know what to do to help the world and stop World War II. So on October 31st of 1942, feast of, on the eve of the Feast of All Saints, he consecrates the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. For some reason, he doesn't say Russia, Sister Lucia had actually talked to our Lord in her private prayer and had said, well, if he does it to the world, that's not the full thing, but, but God will be pleased with that to some extent and grant some graces, so he will shorten the war. Uh, so after this consecration that John, I'm sorry, consecration that Pius XII does, the Allied powers start winning every war, every battle. Uh, up until then, they hadn't won anything. Uh, but there's three critical battles. There's one in El Alamein, down by the Suez Canal that controls the oil fields, and the British defeat uh, Rommel and the German, you know, Panzas out there in North Africa. And then you have Operation Torch, where the Americans landed in North Africa. And then you also had the great battle at Stalingrad. And so there are three major losses that the Germans, the Axis powers, suffer. And, and that pretty much is what you know, signals the, the end of World War II is now in sight. Winston Churchill, not a man of faith, even said something strange happened. It's like the wheels of fortune you know, just changed, and suddenly we started winning the battles. Uh, well, Winston Churchill may not have known what it was, but I am convinced, and I hope you as a Catholic in faith are convinced as well, it's because the Pope called down and invoked the Blessed Mother and started obeying, at least to some extent, consecrating the world to the Immaculate Mary. See, we Catholics, we've got to know our history. We've got to tell this to other people, because that's going to encourage us and give us strength. Uh, okay, 1944, January 2nd, Sister Lucia has been told by her superiors, write down the third secret, but she can't. She talks about how a supernatural force, the devil, was preventing her from her. She, she just couldn't write it down, even though she had permission and was asked to by her superiors. So on January 2nd, 1944, Our Lady appears to her. As far as we know, this is sort of like the last major Fatima apparition. It's private, it's for her, and she gives her all this grace so that she can write down the third secret. And even then, it took her a few days before she could get the secret written down. So the third secret gets written down, and it is supposed to be revealed to the world in 1960 by the express command of the Virgin. 
Connected to all of this, I think, also is the dogma of the Assumption, right? So Pius XII styles himself a Pope of our Blessed Mother. He would even refer to himself as the Pope of Fatima. Interestingly, he was being consecrated a bishop, Pius XII was, Eugenio Pacelli, on the same day, May 13th, that Our Lady was appearing for the first time. There's a powerful connection there as well. But uh, he does declare the dogma of the Assumption, November 1st, 1950. And so as to sort of confirm him in that, our Lady gives him a miracle of the sun in Rome. He sees it four times leading up to it and after it to show her pleasure that he had presented this dogma, infallible dogma to the world, which had been taught since the beginning of the church, but now was sort of sealed and stamped with uh, a bowl of papal infallibility. And you would think at this point that, that Pius XII would have consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart, and he got real close. 1952, July 7th, he wrote a letter Sacro Vergente Anno, part of it was at the request of the Russian people, in which he does consecrate Russia by name to the Immaculate Heart. It's the only time Russia has been consecrated by name to the Immaculate Heart. So I would actually argue, uh, I think we all could, that that's the closest we got to fulfilling Our Lady's command. However, he didn't do it in a public ceremony, and he didn't do it in union with all the bishops of the world, which are two of the other conditions. So again, it's sort of like an incomplete uh, fulfillment of the command that Our Lady asks. In between this time, just so that you know, especially for you who live here in Rome, this has special significance, I think, for you, because in 1947, Our Lady appears as the Virgin of the Apocalypse at Trefontan, not far from St. Paul outside the walls. Uh, again, not enough time to get into those messages, but you can do the research and look them up. And then in 1953, there was the Weeping Madonna of Syracuse, also nearby here, uh, not too far. And those are very connected as well to this age of Mary and Our Lady revealing this message. Unfortunately, in 1957, on April 16th, the third secret of Fatima was sealed up and all the archives that were in Fatima, in Lisbon, that the Bishop Cardinal had there were sent to Rome and were put in the Vatican's uh, sort of high-level offices and would never really have access to the public. Now, to our knowledge, much of that still remains there. So that's when the secret goes to Fatima and it's no longer in the hands of the Bishop of Portugal of Lisbon to reveal it to the world in 1960. Now it's solely going to be under the control, power, authority of the Pope himself. And then on 1957, December 26, there's the famous interview of Father Fuentes with Sister Lucia. I mean, we do have this at our website. Look it up, read it. Uh, I, I reread it every, I don't know, three, four, five, six months. You just gotta go back and reread it because it is very, very appropriate for the times right now. Sister Lucia said many things in that message that are important. She talks about how we can no longer wait for Rome or the bishops to call us to action of prayer and penance, uh, that we have to fight for the salvation of our soul. She talks about how the devil is going to target the religious, the consecrated, the priests, and the bishops, because that's what offends God the most and drags the most souls to hell quickly. She talks of how the devil is in the mood for a climactic, pivotal, final battle with the virgin. Uh, so I think it's quite clear to me from reading this and seeing the history that Sister Lucia already knew she was going to get silenced. She had a premonition on that. Easily, Our Lady could have told her in her private prayer. Uh, and she tried to get out everything she could in this message without violating the command of not revealing the secret, because that's supposed to stay secret until 1960. She's still in 1957. Um, but it was in 1959 of January, so just about a year after this interview, that Pope John XXIII officially and formally silenced Sister Lucia. And so this is the last public interview, and I think she knew that. So that's why it's so important to go back to it and to read it numerous times and to, to ponder those words because they give us good insight into what is taking place in our times and how Our Lady is still watching out for us. So yes, Pius XII died, John XXIII became Pope. In January, he silences Lucia. And then on January 25th, 1959, there at St. Paul outside the walls, he tells the whole world his cardinals that were all assembled on the Feast of St. Paul, Jan 25th again, that he's going to convene this great council for the world. He's going to you know, open the windows and bring in the fresh air. Uh, so that's when Vatican II was called. And over the next three years, the liberal forces began to prepare themselves so they could hijack the council. Hopefully you've read much of this. Uh, the different works, the Rhine flows into the Tiber, 
or Chris Ferrara's Great Facade, or the new book by Professor De Mattei on the real history of Vatican II. Uh, Michael Davies has got a great work on that too, Pope John's Council. You know, inform yourself of what really took place at Vatican II, but it is not a coincidence that just before he announces the council, he silences Sister Lucia. Uh, in, in my own opinion, that had to be premeditated, and it was calculated to say, I don't want Lucia, Sister Lucia saying anything sort of, let's say, against the council, which has led many people to believe, I think rightly so, that some part of that third secret that remains hidden refers to an evil council or in a council that could cause a lot of problems for us. So she silenced, and then the Vatican II is announced, and then some of John the 23rd's advisors were telling him, you know, before you start this council, you really got to read that third secret. You really need to read it, because in 1960, the whole world was waiting for it to be published. My mother, who was in the Blue Army and praying the rosary, still remembers in the 50s how there was this great crescendo all around the world with everyone sort of getting excited. There were rosary rallies everywhere. The stature of Our Lady was going in many cities. They were ready to hear the secret. And so on August... Um, 17th, 1959, John the 23rd reads the third secret. It's brought to him, he opens the envelope, he reads it, says, this is not for our times. That was his judgment. There's more details here. There's certain passages that they, quite, they thought they knew what they meant, but it sort of scared them, and so they brought in a Portuguese priest who knew Portuguese, and he confirmed, that's what it says. Uh, but we won't know the contents of that. We still don't know the contents of that, so there's still that disobedience. And the third secret is silenced. John the 23rd says it's not for our time, and none of the other popes have revealed the message to this day. And then the consecration still hasn't been done. So, so that's where we are now. You know, there's been various attempts. It's interesting. It's like the, the popes can't forget about Fatima. They keep making pilgrimages there. They keep talking about Fatima. Uh, John Paul II continued to consecrate and consecrate and consecrate each time ineffective in 1984. Uh, he didn't do it. He, he even knew he hadn't done it. Uh, the chief exorcist of Rome, Father Gabriel Amorth, who passed away a few years, even testifies he was there, and he says that John Paul II turned to his advisors and said, please, may I say Russia? And they told him, no, no. So it's almost like he wanted to. Why the Pope is turning to his advisors and asking for permission is sort of beyond me, but hopefully that gives you some indication. Some of the things that have gone on here in the Vatican and Rome uh, in, in these years uh, and so he pleaded twice with them. And twice they said no, and so then he didn't mention Russia. I mean, he could have done it right then and there, but he didn't. Uh, so the consecration has yet to be done correctly, which many people don't realize. And then the third secret supposedly was revealed again. John, Paul, I think, kept pushing for it. So in 2000, they finally revealed it, but they only revealed the vision. And then they tried to give it their own interpretation with a false little spin. And so, uh, again, the first part of the secret was the vision of hell, and then all the words that explained it. So that's when Our Lady talked about the consecration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, how many souls would fall into hell. She also talked about how uh, Russia would spread her errors if the world was not consecrated, that many would suffer, that the Pope would suffer much. She talked of the, the need, that, that light that was going to appear in the sky. So all these things were the words that explained the vision of hell. Why are so many souls falling into hell? So again, she gave us a vision in this part of the secret and then explained it with words. Uh, and we know it starts somewhere along the lines of, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. And then there's a dot, dot, dot. That dot, dot, dot means something follows. Those are the words of the virgin that remain hidden to this day. And that wasn't part of the vision that was revealed to us in 2000. So that's the part that still remains hidden. It could talk about things like an evil council. It could talk about dogma be being changed. It could talk about apostasy at the very highest levels of the church. Uh, there's a number of, I think, well-grounded theories on what it says. Uh, but that's where we're at today. And so with every day or every month or every year that passes, we continue to grow in our disobedience of Our Lady because it's taking us longer and longer to obey. 1929, Russia was supposed to be consecrated. 1960, the third secret was supposed to be revealed. And those have not been fulfilled. Okay? And instead, things have just gotten worse and worse and worse, with more human solutions being proposed, but never our Blessed Mother's supernatural solution being followed. So we're not getting out of this. I, I hate to say it, but things are going to get worse. It is inevitable. This is the promise of Our Lady. Things are going to keep getting worse until we obey her. 
I mean, again, I can give you my personal theories. I, I see a parallel I've already gone over. It. World War I, a pope calls on her help, and she answers. World War II, a pope calls on her help, and she answers. I somehow think we're going to be in an even worse war when finally a pope decides to call on her help, and maybe that's when we're going to get uh, the consecration. I, I don't know. Right? I don't know that. But I mean, there's patterns. And the one I'll close with, I think, is significant because in 1931, Sister Lucia was in Rancho, Spain. And our Lord appeared to her and said a very important statement because he said, the popes have delayed too long to obey. Eventually, they will obey, but it will be too late, just like the kings of France. So what is our Lord alluding to? This is why as Catholics, we need our historical context. And we try to set that up in this talk. In 1689, that's when our Lord, as the Sacred Heart, appears to Mary Margaret Alacoque, the saint, and says, I want consecration to my heart in France, and that devotion spread. At that time, France was the most powerful country in the world. It's the Sun King, you know, who considered Louis XIV the most powerful monarch. And of course, in his pride, he says, no, no, I won't do it. So now, what do we have? Instead of the Sacred Heart, it's the Immaculate Heart. Instead of France, largest country and powerful in the world, now it's Russia, the largest landmass in this world that is the most atheistic country. And instead of the King of France having to consecrate, it's the Pope. You see how in each one it got up. France to Russia was bigger. Sacred Heart goes there. The Immaculate Heart, those two go together. They're the same heart. And instead of the king, it's the Pope. So there's a real connection between those two because it's the Sacred Heart of our Lord and the Immaculate Heart of Mary that together must reign, reign over the whole world. That's what this consecration is about. Uh, we're going to see great miracles take place when it finally does happen. Uh, but again, he said, just like the kings of France, 1789 in June, the French Revolution breaks out. You know, Louis XIV, Louis XV, Louis the Sixteenth, they all had their shot, their chance to consecrate France. None of them did. And then Louis the Seventeenth gets thrown in the, in the cells and gets his head chopped off. It is said that while he was imprisoned, uh, he made a consecration to France, uh, but he lost his head. Remember the third secret also, that vision talks about the Pope being assassinated, being murdered, you know, in execution fashion when he has to climb the hill and the arrows, the arrows and the bullets kill him. Uh, this was not the assassination attempt on John Paul. He didn't die. There was no hail. There were no bullets, no soldiers. Okay, it's a completely different thing. That, that's part of the false spin they give on the interpretation of the third secret's vision. Um, but there's great hope. There's great hope because we know that once Russia is consecrated, great miracles are going to take place. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to also bring up Our Lady of Guadalupe. Because while Protestantism was sort of running over Europe and running amok and we're losing all these Catholics over there, you know, the, the kingdom of Christ is being brought in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere. Well, now it's like the whole world is losing the faith. And yet, in the most atheistic country that spread all these evils, um, the red country for the red dragon, uh, that's where the great conversions are going to start. And so we're going to see something even more magnificent than with Our Lady of Guadalupe. We saw 10 million people by this miracle when they looked at this tilma. It's going to be, you know, the, the numbers will be so much greater. It's going to dwarf what happened at Guadalupe. <clears throat> Likewise, the miracles that Our Lady of Lourdes wrought are going to be dwarfed by the miracles that are worked once Our Lady of Fatima is obeyed. So a glorious Catholic restoration is coming. There will be peace on earth. We have that promise. It's going to happen. It's for sure. It's guaranteed. The question is just when. How many souls will be lost? How much will we have to suffer before we wake up, talk to our friends, talk to our family, and talk to ourselves so that we get with the Fatima program, begin to pray our rosary daily, do the first five Saturdays, do penance, pray unceasingly, and talk to others to share that message as much as we can so that we can raise a lot of prayers to heaven and get the graces for the Pope in union with the bishops to consecrate Russia, as Our Lady has asked. Hopefully you realize just how important this message is. Our, our, our salvation really does depend on it, and certainly is the salvation and the good of the world. So thank you for your attention. Let's close with another Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.